Our best sports performance, muscular strength, and coordination is in the afternoon. We're most likely to go to sleep at night when the body secretes the sleep hormone melatonin. And conversely, the highest testosterone levels are usually in the morning, and your best blood sugar control is also usually in the morning in most people. So there's kind of like an optimal time of day for us to do all sort of tasks or aspects of our metabolism behavior. There's like an optimal time of day to do everything. Now, before we dive into today's episode, I wanted to clarify that some of the info you're going to hear, first and foremost, this episode is about fasting. There'll be discussion around food restriction, and if that's a topic that's hard for you, feel free to skip this one. While the research is fascinating, I want you to take care of yourself above all else. And second, I want to remind you that water fasts are done in clinical settings, and they should not be attempted on your own. Now, enjoy the show. Courtney, welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Jason. It's so great to have you. I'm, I'm a big fan of your work. And wh why don't we start by you telling us a bit about your background the, and the work you do in your lab? Sure. So growing up, I was always a pretty sporty kid, played sports four seasons a year round. I love reading my mom's family circle magazines on nutrition. For those of you who remember those magazines in the 80s and uh, early 90s. And always just love science. Went to college, wasn't sure what I wanted to study in the long term, but I always found nutrition really interesting. I ended up studying physics because I, I really liked a lot of aspects of his physics, but then kind of got to the end of a physics PhD and said, I don't know really where I'm going from here because a lot of the work we were doing, I was in a branch of physics called uh, cosmology, where we study the physics of the early universe less than a second after the Big Bang. And I realized 99% of the theories you were coming up with were probably going to be wrong. <laughs> and I just thought if I got to the end of my life, I sort of had the entrepreneur's mindset where I wanted to be in a field in which if I took a big risk and I failed, I was glad that I was still in that field. And I couldn't quite say that in physics. Like if I came up with some theory of the universe that was wrong, I'm not sure I would be glad that I was there. And all along, my interest in nutrition had just been going up and up. And I just saw a tremendous potential to... Um, take nutritional approaches and try to reverse um, and treat chronic diseases. And at the time, this was over a decade ago, there weren't a lot of people doing that sort of work. And around this time too, this was maybe a decade and a half ago, I heard the first sort of, this is back when podcasts just started to become in vogue. I heard this really interesting podcast where they said, you know, there was this research study and they had people eat in a four hour period and fast for 20 hours a day. And they got all kinds of great benefits. And I thought, well, this is absolutely fascinating. And I've been really interested in all kinds of work surrounding fasting, kind of prolonged water only fasts. And I thought, well, this is wonderful, but I don't think I could practically do three to five day fasts <laughs> periodically. What's the easiest way to kind of get the benefits of fasting without actually doing prolonged fasting? And at the time, the word time-restricted eating had not been invented, but I was very much interested in daily intermittent fasting. So when I got to the end of my PhD program, I actually switched fields. I uh, just emailed people out of the blue who are working either in intermittent fasting or in plant-rich uh, foods, because I was also interested in plant-rich food groups, and uh, ended up switching to the lab of Eric Ravison, who did the largest study on calorie restriction to slow the aging process in humans as well as the first, one of the first studies on intermittent fasting in humans. So I started off in his lab uh, over a decade ago. And right around that time, I think it was 2012, the first animal study on time-restricted eating with the title Time-Restricted Eating was published. And uh, just to give listeners a little bit of a backstory. So we define intermittent fasting as any sort of approach where you alternate periods of eating and extended fasting. Now, there's no one single definition that everyone agrees on on what's the minimum duration of fasting you need to be fasting for for something to constitute intermittent fasting. But I'm on an international group uh, consensus committee of scientists where we're moving towards a 14-hour definition. So anything where you fast for at least 14 hours at a time repeatedly constitutes intermittent fasting. Um, and so time-restricted eating is effectively a form of intermittent fasting. Now there's several other types of approaches. So, you know, just to give some examples of intermittent fasting, for instance, if you fast for 24 hours at a time, drinking only water, that would constitute intermittent fasting. So a lot of religious traditions have you fast for 24 hours once a week. 
Um, there are other approaches where you eat a very low calorie diet, kind of the equivalent of one meal uh, a day, something like two to three times a week. And then on the other end of the spectrum, there's this daily intermittent fasting that we call time restricted eating. And that's where you eat in a shorter time period and you fast for a longer period each day. So anytime you sort of fast for at least 14 hours a day, we call that now time restricted eating. And that's equivalent to effectively eating in a 10 hour window or less. And you can do that either by eating breakfast later in the day and or dinner earlier in the day. And what was so groundbreaking about this study done in rodents in 2012 is they uh, took a bunch of rodents and they had them either graze throughout the day or to practice time restricted eating by eating in an eight hour period and then fasting for 16 hours. And what they found is despite the rodents eating the exact same amount of food, the rodents who did time restricted eating had better blood sugar control, they gained less weight, uh, they had less uh, fat in their liver, they had lower cholesterol levels, and just across the board, their health was better. And so this was some of the first data we had that intermittent fasting has benefits independent of what you eat. So suggesting there's something special about having these prolonged fasting periods. And a lot to unpack there. That was very helpful. Do the health benefits occur in the time we're not eating in that 16 hours? Or do they occur in that smaller window of, of time restricted eating where we're, we're eating the same amount, but it's condensed in eight hours? Or is it both? It's probably both, although I would say most people think it comes from that prolonged fasting period. So what we know is when you eat food, uh, a typical large meal takes about four to six hours to digest. Once you're done digesting that meal, then your body starts burning glycogen, which is kind of short stored uh, sugar that's stored in your muscles and your liver. And it starts burning that for fuel. And then once your body sort of runs out of this glycogen, it starts burning fat for fuel at a much higher rate. And it does this um, both by burning fat directly, but also recycling some protein in your body as well. And um, we find that once you get to about 11 to 13 hours of fasting, that's when we see a big increase in sort of rejuvenative processes in the body. So we start to see an increase in things like autophagy. So autophagy is just a fancy word that means recycling worn out proteins in cells and kind of rejuvenating and repairing them. We also see that fat burning is maximal with about 12 to 24 hours of fasting. So if you look at the rate of fat burning, we really see a big increase in fat burning around that time period. Um, and then once you get to more like two or three days of fasting, the body starts saying, oh my goodness, we've been fasting for a while. There's been no food. Now it's time to conserve resources. So it goes, I don't want to quite say starvation mode, but it starts saying, okay, we can't just burn fat willy nilly. We need to conserve some of our resources. And then there's some other really cool things that happen too. So with longer periods of fasting, um, there's evidence that that gives your body more time to get rid of sodium in your diet, which in turn lowers your blood pressure. So there's really cool data that shows with two to three days of fasting, your body excretes a lot of excess sodium and lowers your blood pressure. On the flip side of things, there's some evidence that there's some benefits from also eating in that shorter time period, the actual eating period. So for instance, when you come out of the fast and you first break that fast, there are what are called anabolic benefits. So there's benefits there for muscle building. Um, and that's been known for a long time. And then also we find that um, when you eat a number of meals in a short period of time, we find that actually seems to lower blood sugar levels. And the way we think that works is your body has a blood sugar hormone called insulin, and it secretes this insulin when you eat a meal. And what happens is if you eat a couple meals and sh um, one after another, insulin doesn't have enough time to kind of return to fasting levels. And so it remains elevated. So then if you eat your next meal, insulin's already awake, it's doing its job. And so you don't have to secrete as much insulin for your body to keep your blood sugar under control. So we actually find that there's this sort of second meal effect that naturally lowers your blood sugar. So there are a bunch of different benefits that we think are active during the fasting and eating period. So I have a lot of follow-up questions. So if, if I am practicing intermittent fasting for longevity benefits, you know, relatively healthy, 
is there you you mentioned establishing 14 is kind of the 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 established record of defining intermittent fasting and so is you know, 16, 10% better than 14 and 18, another 10% better than 16 in terms of benefits, or is it a shade of gray? Yeah. So we don't know the answer in people, but I will say generally the studies on time restricted eating that I've used shorter eating windows report more benefits in animals. There have been some studies comparing, for instance, I think it was eight hour it was either eight or nine hour eating window versus a 12 hour eating window. And they found the shorter the eating window, the greater the benefits. Um, so it does seem to be that you get more benefits, the shorter the eating window. And I think there are probably some extra benefits that if you eat, for instance, in a six hour period, which is very short and fast for 18 hours a day, that it's probably harder to eat all your food in that time period. So you probably just naturally eat less independent of any benefits you get from your metabolism directly. And next, and, and this is how I discovered you, you came up on a Google alert, is time of day of when you are eating. And conventional thought prior to you, or at least for me, conventional thought for me prior to discovering you and your work was if you were practicing intermittent fasting, you would sk skip breakfast, have a lunch and dinner and that would be it but then came you and your work and <laughs> tell us what you found in your study in time of day because i think it's counterintuitive to the ways a lot of us have been practicing intermittent fasting yeah absolutely I, I will so when i first started my studies on intermittent fasting a decade ago there wasn't a lot of research on intermittent fasting in fact there are only maybe one or two studies on time restricted eating in, in humans and people and at the time what was really interesting is there was a huge increase of in interest in doing intermittent fasting studies but there's this parallel field of chronobiology, so this is the science of your biological clock that was developing parallel, and they were also finding intermittent fasting was beneficial. And what was really interesting is there was a study about a decade ago uh, testing the old adage of eating breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince, and dinner like a pauper. And so what they did in this study is they took women who were who wanted to lose weight, and they divided them into two groups. So one group ate breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince, and dinner like a pauper. And the other group was asked to eat the same number of calories, but in the reverse order. So small breakfast and large dinner. And what they found is that the group that ate most of their calories for breakfast and for lunch lost significantly more weight. And not only did they lose more weight, they were less hungry. So if you view this from the opposite lens, the group that ate the small breakfast and ate most of their calories for dinner, they struggled to lose weight. So they lost less weight. And not only that, but they were hungrier than the group that was more successful with weight loss. So really fascinating data. And I took a deep dive into this, this uh, research study and I realized we've actually known for about the past 50 years that your blood sugar control in most people is actually best in the morning and it gets worse as the day progresses. So if you do a blood sugar test in people in the morning, the afternoon and the evening, you'll find that in response to eating the same amount of sugar, your blood sugar control is best in the morning. And if you eat that same amount of sugar in the afternoon, the evening, even though it's the same meal, your blood sugar levels spike significantly higher. So this kind of suggests our metabolism is optimized to metabolize food in that mid to late morning period, so earlier in the day. Now, what was interesting is the time this was discovered, we knew nothing about biological clocks or that we all have a circadian system. And just as background, we all have an internal biological clock called the circadian system. And this system kind of organizes our body in these 24 hour rhythms that we call circadian rhythms. And they make us, the system makes us better at doing different things at different times of the day. So for instance, our best sports performance, muscular strength and coordination is in the afternoon. We're most likely to go to sleep at night when the body secretes the sleep hormone melatonin. And conversely, the highest testosterone levels are usually in the morning. And your best blood sugar control is also usually in the morning in most people. So there's kind of like an optimal time of day for us to do all sort of 
tasks or um, aspects of our metabolism behavior. There's like an optimal time of day to do everything. And um, we didn't know that at the time that we discovered our blood sugar control is best early in the morning. We didn't know that was because of the circadian system. But what we know now, there's been a huge jump in our understanding, so much so that the Nobel Prize was a recently awarded for the discovery of the circadian system. But the way you can think of the circadian system is every cell, nearly every cell and organ in the body has its own sort of biological clock that's, that ticks and, and you know keeps a time. Um, but to make sense of all these clocks, we group them into two broad systems. So there's a clock in the brain, and this clock is kind of the master clock. You can think of it as like the conductor of all the rest of the clocks in the body, and the rest of the clocks in the body you can think of as the orchestra. And what's interesting is the clock that's in the brain, its time zone is set by when you get bright light expo exposure. So, and by bright light, I mean outdoor light. It has to be outdoor light or sunlight. Um, or it could be a light therapy box, but it's not normal indoor light. And um, this is the basis of how we adapt to different time zones. Um, it's by getting light in those new time zones. So that's how our body knows what time zone it's in and how to set that clock in the brain. Conversely, all those other clocks that are like, you know, uh, different instruments in an orchestra, their time zones are set by a variety of factors, but one of the most important ones is the time of day that we eat. Those clocks, their time zones are largely set by, you know, are you eating early in the day, later in the day, and so forth. So because we have these two different clock systems and their time zones are set by different factors, when you're eating out of sync, with when you get bright light, if you're eating out of sync with when you get bright light exposure, say you get bright light in the morning and you're eating late at night, that puts those orchestra type clocks in a different time zone from the conductor clock. And so what happens is you get, get conflicting signals to your metabolism about whether to rev up or to rev down, right? So for instance, if you're eating uh, late at night, the clock in your brain says, hey, hey, it's time for us to go to sleep. We don't wanna metabolize food. Whereas those clocks and the rest of the body were say, or will be saying, well, we usually eat late at night. Let's try to like rev up our metabolism. And so as a result, you get these problems in your metabolism because it's like your metabolism gets these conflicting signals. So the analogy here is like the different sections of the orchestra are kind of playing out of sync with each other. So you don't get optimal metabolism. And so the punchline is it looks like when you eat earlier in the day, that's better for your metabolism. And in fact, there've been a number of studies now that have found that if you eat most of your calories early in the day, or even if you just eat an earlier lunch, you lose more weight. So for instance, there was a really nice study in Spain. In Spain, they eat lunch very late in the day. So median times about 2.45 in the afternoon. And that study found that when adults ate lunch earlier in the day, they lost more weight in a weight loss program than if they actually ate lunch later in the day. So a bunch of research has just really demonstrated this core principle that if you eat early in the day, it seems to improve weight loss or help you lose weight. It also improves your blood sugar control, and it may also improve your appetite and your blood pressure. So I saw this data way back in 2012 and thought, this is fascinating. I wonder what would happen if we combine this intermittent fasting or time-restricted eating with eating in alignment with our circadian rhythms. So eating early in the day. And I was interested in the question, what's the maximum benefit we can get from changing when you eat? You know, what's the biggest benefit you can get from any sort of meal timing approach? And so we did a study in men with prediabetes where we tested this, um, this uh, approach. Um, we call it early time-restricted eating. Early meaning you're eating early in the day, time-restricted eating, you're practicing time-restricted eating. And in this study, we had the men try two different eating schedules. So they either ate over a six hour period, starting around roughly 8 a.m. and then starting dinner around 2 p.m. So everyone was done eating dinner by about 3 p.m. Or we had them eat over a 12 hour period. And the really cool thing we did in this study is we were also interested in the question, are there benefits to intermittent fasting even if you don't lose weight? So we had, when the men tried the two different schedules, they ate the exact same amount of food on both schedules. They weren't allowed to lose weight. We watched them while they eat their meals. So it was a very rigorous study. These are the most rigorous types of studies you can do. And what we found is that when they ate, when they did this early time restricted eating, they improved their blood, uh, their insulin sensitivity, they lowered their blood pressure, 
and they also reduce the amount of oxidative stress in the body. And what you can think of, oxidative stress basically is just a form of molecular damage in the body. So we found basically less molecular damage in the body. Um, and this was despite the fact that no one lost weight. So it demonstrated that at least some forms of time-restricted eating have benefits, even if you don't lose weight, even if you don't change what you're eating. So in summary, if we have an eating window between noon and eight, move it up to 10 and six, or maybe eight and four, and see what happens. And personally, since I discovered your work, I was sharing this with you before we started recording. You know, I've been experimenting with this. And I'll share data just from my aura ring where, you know, yesterday, for example, was Sunday. So I also, we'll talk about different days of the week because if you have a social life, sometimes this can be tough to implement. I, I really don't have a social life. I'm married. We have two little kids. So, um, you know, for example, on Saturday, my wife and I were able to go out and have dinner. So my eating window was about 11 a.m. to call it. 6 15 p.m we go to bed really early and i woke up the next morning with an hrv of 80 and a resting heart rate of, of 43 so you know not, not bad pretty good but the next day yesterday sunday my eating window was from about 9 a.m to call it 3 p.m and still went to bed super early around 9 hrv was 115 Resting heart rate was 44, about the same, but like significantly better HRV. And I've done a number of experiments like this. And where I'm going, I mentioned I use an aura ring. How much of this is because of the downstream effect that sleep has? We know that if you have, you know, a sleep best practice is try to eat at least three hours if you can before bedtime and the larger the meal you have the more difficult it is for some people to sleep the more difficult it is to normalize your heart rate uh, how much of it if this is because of sleep and i know and i think it's so interesting you your, your work goes hand in hand. You're studying sleep and circadian rhythm, and you're also studying time-restricted eating slash intermittent fasting. They go hand in hand. So I'll, I'll pause there. I think most of it's probably not due to sleep, to be honest. Probably most of it is just due to circadian rhythms. And there is a little bit of overlap between sleep and circadian rhythms, but circadian rhythms are very different. Um, circadian rhythms are really like what time of day does your metabolism peak? In terms of there, and there are a bunch of different like meta uh, uh, metabolic pathways in the body. So we talked earlier about blood sugar control, and we know in most people there are some exceptions. So in people who do shift work, they may need to eat at a different time of day. But in most people, your blood sugar control is best in the mid to late morning. We also see that there's a process called the thermic effect of food, which is how many calories you burn when you're eating food, and that's also higher in the morning. And then we also see cholesterol transport seems to be most effective in sort of the early afternoon. So a lot of these things suggest that earlier in the day is better. Um, so we think a lot of this is really just due to the circadian system. So eating in alignment with those rhythms. Now, there are probably also benefits from just having a longer fasting period. Um, so for instance, we know that the longer you fast, the lower your insulin levels are. And if you're not fasting for days at a time, Generally, if you're just, you know, fasting for 14 or 16 hours, that extra bit of fasting not only lowers insulin levels, but it also increases insulin sensitivity because your, your organs and your tissues and your cells are like, hey, we need glucose. It's been a while. Let's take it up much more quickly. And so those cells become more effective at taking up glucose into your bloodstream. Um, that said, there are some principles you, you mentioned that I think are really important. So the rule about not eating within three hours of bedtime, I think that is probably a really important, nice rule of thumb for a lot of people. And the reason why this rule makes a lot of sense is about, for most people, about maybe two up to three hours before bedtime, your body starts to produce melatonin, which is a sleep hormone. But what we just learned, gosh, about seven years ago is that melatonin it's a really, really powerful antioxidant in the body. 
but when it's elevated, it actually worsens your blood sugar control. So even though melatonin is wonderful, it helps you sleep, it increases kind of that um, rejuvenation period in the body because it's an antioxidant itself. At the same time, it makes your blood sugar control immediately worse. And so we don't want you really eating when your melatonin levels are elevated. So there's a little bit of a connection there with sleep. Now, the interesting thing we recently did is we did a study um, on early time restricted eating where we had people uh, eat in an eight hour period and then fast for the rest of the day. And we said, you know, eat between 7 a.m. in the morning and 3 p.m. in the afternoon. So a little bit more on the extreme uh, end of early time restricted eating. But the interesting thing we found is that when we told people to do that, those who stuck with the program reported sleeping about 30 minutes less. And at first we were a little alarmed by this because normally if you do research, you don't want to see, you know, your participants sleeping less. But we also had really cool data asking them about how's your fatigue? How are your energy levels? And the really interesting thing we found is that people reported more energy and less fatigue and they were sleeping less. So we think that the early time restricted eating, because it gives you that longer window to rest and repair before you fall asleep, that perhaps you need less sleep to feel rejuvenated. Now, we don't think this, the same is necessarily true if you do time-restricted eating later in the day, but we don't know yet. So we're just starting to see studies comparing early time-restricted eating versus time-restricted eating where you skip breakfast. And the two largest of those studies suggest that early time-restricted eating is indeed better than practicing time-restricted eating by skipping breakfast. But the important thing is there still seem to be some benefits you get by practicing time-restricted eating and skipping breakfast. So there still seems to be benefits for weight loss and potentially for leptin, but the early time-restricted eating seems to have far more benefits for lowering blood sugar, blood pressure, heart rate, uh, hunger, and um, improving thyroid access activity. And in terms of that, call it six-hour to eight-hour feeding window, Better to have one meal, two meals, three meals, does it matter? We don't know yet. Uh, I'm not necessarily a big fat fan of what are called the OMAD approaches, the one meal a day approaches, O-M-A-D approaches. Uh, and the reason why is because it's such a huge amount of food in a short period of time. So your blood sugar levels are likely to go very high. And we just don't, we don't have a lot of data on that yet. My recommendation right now for most people would be to eat three to four meals in that window. And what we have found is six hours is actually difficult for a lot of people to stick with, unless you're doing it for weight loss. If you're doing it for weight loss and want to do six hours and you can do it, awesome, go for it. But we find that for most people, the eight to 10 hour window is the best target. And in fact, for a lot of people, some people even struggle with eating in an eight hour period. It's, it's quite difficult. So if, if you're one of those people, start with 10 hours and then work your way down to eight. But most people, we find that sweet spot is eight to 10 hours. And in terms of what you're eating, I think of macros. What have we learned about protein, fat, carbs, and the makeup of what we're eating in that window? Yeah, we don't have any good studies on that yet. Um, we are just starting to see some studies comparing, interestingly, ke uh, ketogenic diets and intermittent fasting and time-restricted eating in particular. Uh, interestingly, one of those studies found time-restricted eating was more effective than a ketogenic diet in terms of improving weight loss and uh, blood sugar control, which is not necessarily what I have expect would have expected, but very interesting. Uh, but we don't have any data on whether it's better to eat a certain macronutrient composition or not during that window. I just generally encourage people to eat a healthy diet that's generally lower glycemic and focus on whole foods. The number one thing I recommend from a healthy diet perspective is just to eliminate processed food because that seems to have a far greater effect on weight loss than any sort of macronutrient composition. So Kevin Hall, um, who's a big researcher at the National Institutes of Health, did a really cool study on processed food. And he found that when people ate ultra processed food, they ate about 500 calories per day more. So it's a far greater effect than any differences that we find in weight loss due to high versus low carb diets. So, so something that I'm focused on and many people are, are, are focused on is increasing muscle mass, maintaining muscle mass um, as we age. And does time-restricted eating affect our ability to maintain or build muscle mass? 
Yeah, great question. So we recently, my lab recently did the largest study to do what are called DEXA scans. So DEXA is an x-ray scanning technique that tells you how much body fat and how much muscle mass someone has, as well as how much bone they have in their body. And we found absolutely no negative effects from time-restricted eating on muscle mass. So we found um, that you lose more body fat, but you're able to maintain all your muscle mass. That said, there have been a couple studies that have found a small decrease in muscle mass from time-restricted eating. One of those studies was a study that involved skipping breakfast. So maybe skipping breakfast would be less ideal. But the, but the small amount of muscle mass they found, uh, the small amount of decrease in muscle mass they found in that study was really, really small. So it, it would below the level that we normally would consider important. Um, so very, maybe a very small effect if you skip breakfast, but hard, hard to know for certain. So it sounds like probably better off having something to eat before you do strength training. Uh, potentially. The data on that are actually really mixed. Some studies suggest that eating a little bit of carbs and protein before a training session is good. Others find there's no difference um, at all based on the timing of when you ingest food. So that data is still pretty mixed. And in terms of execution, if I'm listening and I'm interested in moving up my, my dinner or eliminating dinner, if you have a family, that can be difficult, but it's possible. You can do it here and there, but maybe maybe difficult to execute on a daily basis. And so are there benefits if you're able to condense the eating windows you're eating earlier in the day a couple days a week, then you go back to eating later in the day the rest of the week? Can you talk about like the, the makeup of the week? If we've got seven days, is there a threshold? You need to do this at least four days or every day. How do you think about the minimum requirements? Yeah, absolutely. So in all, in a lot of the studies we do, we tell people to stick with the program six days a week on average. And we do that in part in our studies to one, give people a break, right? Because most people don't want to do this every day of their lives. And then two, we still want to keep standards high. Um, so we generally recommend six days a week. That said, there have been two studies in animals that find that if the animals practice time-restricted eating on weekdays and then go off their schedule and so-called so party on the weekends, they still get benefits. It's not quite as much or the same degree of benefits as if they followed it daily, but the point is it still seems like there are benefits to doing it five days a week. And we recently did an analysis of some of our data, and we found that people who followed it five days a week every week had improvements in their blood sugar levels, their heart rate, uh, they lost more weight, which is no surprise. Um, they also had bigger improvements in mood and then they slept 30 minutes less, less. So I suspect five days a week is sufficient based on the studies that we've done is sufficient for people to see benefits in the long term. And what would be the gold standard? If I'm gonna do that, is it, is it eating between eight and two, nine and three? What, what would be the gold standard in your opinion? Oh, goodness. We don't have enough data for me to give you a clear answer that I know is correct and true. But um, I suspect that probably the if you were to ask me a best approach that's sustainable for long term benefits, I would say for most people, maybe a six to eight hour window finishing in the mid afternoon. Um, so for me, that might be between two and four, but that's not practical for many people. So maybe five, five or six, if you can swing that. But honestly, the way I think about it is these are such personal decisions, right? Like, you know, one person may be willing to exercise 30 minutes a day and, and someone else may say, I'm going to do 60 minutes a day. And we shouldn't celebrate or denigrate either of those efforts. Like each person is picking what's doable for them. So what I like to do is kind of rank the options so that people can figure out what's best for them and their family. So if I were to rank the options based on the research we have, I would say early time restricted eating in a six to nine hour window, stopping sometime in the mid afternoon or, you know, five or 6 p.m. is probably the gold standard. And then if you were to ask for the next best approach, I think it's probably actually eating breakfast like a king lunch like a prince and dinner like a pauper. There's also some really cool data suggesting that type of approach improves fertility. It improves blood sugar levels. It even helps um, people with type two diabetes produce more insulin because um, that's a concern in, in those folks. And then 
third, I would say time restricted eating by skipping breakfast uh, would be my third choice. And then my last choice would be doing nothing. <laughs> so you're a busy mom. What do you do? Oh, goodness. Well, so let me tell you before and after. Um, so before I had kids, I typically ate in a six to eight hour window, stop starting around 8 a.m. every day and stopping between 2 to 4 p.m. I would also try to go outside before 8 a.m. and to exercise before breakfast because there is some data uh, suggesting that if you exercise before you eat breakfast, you get greater weight loss and appetite suppression benefits. Um, so that was what I used to do. And then when I went out to eat, I would typically do what everyone else was doing. So I would just take a break day and not worry about it. Um, since I've been a mom, so when I was pregnant and when I was breastfeeding, I grazed throughout the day because I just wanted to make sure I had a good milk supply. And then after that, I still eat most of my calories early in the day. And then some days I do early time restricted eating. And then other days I just eat breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince, and dinner like a pauper. And on the days where I eat dinner like a pauper, usually I'm just eating a, a, a large salad or something, you know, like 200 calories or something like that with my family. You know, you, you've talked about circadian rhythm being in line with sunlight. And, and I've spoke about this on the show before. I just think it's such a terrible idea that we're considering making daylight savings permanent. <laughs> What's your take? Oh, it's such a hard question. I'm I'm going to probably betray all my other researchers because I'm not a big fan of I, so I, in in full disclosure, I live on the eastern part of the time zone, so the sun gets up really early here. So, um with daylight um savings time in that time zone shift, I am generally more of a fan of like the sun rising a little bit later in the day cuz I worry about people waking up um, after the sun rises. So there are two things that what we, what we really want to do is one, have people get bright light exposure, sunlight exposure right after they wake up. But the other thing is for a lot of people, they will feel better when they wake up when the sun rises. So if the sun rises at like 5 a.m., a lot of people are still going to be sleeping. And so when the sun rises at five and say you wake up at 6.30, you're going to feel a little jet lagged and you're not going to feel great. So I, I kind of split hairs on this and just say you should try to wake up when the sun rises. I don't know the right answer. It's such a hard question, but I am not necessarily on the same page as, as other researchers on this one. Um, but those are my, my, my practical advice for feeling well rested are generally wake up at the same time every day, which doesn't necessarily mean going to sleep at the same time every day, but waking up at the same time every day and then time that to be approximate the time the sun rises or, or some consistent time around the time it starts getting daylight and then try to get bright light exposure when you wake up. But that, that's the thing, if they make daylight savings permanent, the sunrise is gonna become later and later. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But at any rate, I'll, I'll, I'll stop on that one. But there is a way to combat that. Let me just quickly insert. So I use blue light therapy glasses um, to mimic the sun. So 2019, we first started seeing these products come to the market. They're little glasses that you can put on and it shines blue or green light in your eyes and that mimics the sun and it wakes up your circadian system. And so this morning, for instance, I put on my blue light glasses for 20 minutes because it was freezing outside. And so I got my dose of bright light that way. So there are ways around it. There, there's so many out there. I'm curious which brand you have. Oh, I was using, I think, the product called, it's either Blue Sky or Sky. It's a European product. It's a really lightweight, oh, Pocket Sky. That's what it's called, Pocket Sky. And so staying on this idea of circadian rhythm and trying to, trying to align with our circadian rhythm, I can't help but think of those who have to work the night shift. Can you talk a bit about your, your work there, specifically, I think, a study about nurses, day shift versus night shift? Yeah, so really fascinating. There's been a lot of work recently on shift work, night shift work in particular. And what we found is night shift work just messes up your body's um, clock rhythms and in such a way that we find that individuals who work the night shift are far more likely to get bariatric or weight loss surgery to have big increases in their body weight. They're at a much higher risk. I think it's about 30% higher risk of cancer. So across the board, we just see that shift work, night shift work is a big problem. This, you know, sleeping at sleeping and eating at the wrong time of day. And in fact, it's so much of an issue that the World Health Organization has called it a, a probable carcinogen. 
Um, so so uh, big problems there. So one of the studies we recently ran is we wanted to know like how big of an effect is working the night shift on your metabolism. So we did a just a simple study of nurses. We had them come in and we measured their insulin and leptin levels as well as some other um, sort of molecules related to their health. And the interesting thing we found is that leptin levels were about two times higher um, in, or no, yeah, leptin, sorry, insulin levels were about two times higher in nurses who worked the night shift. And then leptin levels were also about twofold different. And what that suggests is that in people who work the night shift, their um, insulin um, resistance is much higher, meaning their blood sugar control is much worse. And then also their appetite is kind of gone haywire. Um, they just don't get the same like satisfaction from their from their food. Um, and so the effects are really quite staggering. So a lot of the research these days is kind of focused on, well, what time of day should these folks eat? So what's really interesting is you measure their circadian rhythms, their rhythms tend to be very weak and they often are in the wrong time zone. So the question is, if you take, if you have people whose circadian rhythms are messed up, what time of day should they eat to be in sync with those circadian rhythms? And there's a lot of research going on this now. We don't have the final answer yet, but there was a study recently that found um, that it's probably better for people who work the night shift to eat during the daytime when it's when it's light outside and not to eat on their shift. Um, the one caveat is this study was done in people who don't usually work the night shift. So I'm not 100 percent certain that, you know, that'll be the final answer. But um, that's the best data we have so far. It's interesting. And, you know, the steam of of managing weight has come up a number of times as you've talked about the benefits. And, you know, we started to dive into nutrition. You referenced eat a whole foods diet. And nutrition science is so confusing, overwhelming, contradictory. And if someone's trying to lose weight and they're looking to nutrition, I can see why someone would become confused and disillusioned and not get anywhere. You know, I, I can't eat beans. I can't eat beans. I can eat meat. I can't eat meat. Whereas intermittent fasting and time-restricted eating is pretty simple to follow. So when I think of our obesity problem, it seems to me like we should be spending a lot more time talking about intermittent fasting and time-restricted eating and your work than all of these diets and programs that are available. So the really interesting thing is we find that it's, it's really easy for people to understand the concept. Not everyone can stick with a different schedule because it depends a lot on your work schedule, your family obligations, etc. What we find it's way easier for us to tell people a simple rule, count time rather than count calories. Because when you have to ask people to start counting calories, no one likes counting calories. <laughs> you have to learn about portion sizes. You have to start learning the calorie amounts of different food. And then you have to think, okay, oh, what foods am I going to eat? How am I going to shop? Like, how am I going to cook? So it's just way more complicated than a simple rule, like don't eat outside of these hours. So we find that people like it a lot better than a lot of standard approaches and certainly more than calorie counting. And in fact, a lot of research has shown that, um, that when you just give people a simple rule like time restricted eating, they naturally eat less. Now, our, our lab has shown that it's not just because people are not snacking. We find that it genuinely lowers their appetite hormones. So we have measured a hormone called ghrelin, which is one of your main hunger hormones. And we find that time restricted eating reduces ghrelin levels so people are less hungry. So we do think that there are direct effects that this isn't just because people aren't snacking. It's because we are actually making people less hungry. So there are, there are, are benefits to metabolism. Um, but on the flip side, I mean, that said, I wouldn't tell people not to care about eating a healthy diet because data still suggests probably eating a healthy diet is probably a little bit more important than when you eat your meals. What you eat is probably still more important than when you eat. However, probably more people are able to change when they eat than necessarily eat a very healthy diet. And then my, my top tip for eating a healthy diet is whole foods, whole foods, whole foods. And then we can start talking about macros beyond that. But I would always start with just whole unprocessed foods. And you mentioned eating less, and it makes me think of Walter Longo, 
and his ver- his version of fasting mimicking, where essentially it's a five day diet and you're really not eating much at all. Can you talk about the benefits of what he's doing? Sure, absolutely. So. Walter has done a lot of really interesting work in the realm of fasting, aging, and cancer. And Walter did some really phenomenal work showing that if you fast animals, animals that have cancer, prior to chemotherapy and radiation, it causes the healthy cells to go in this self-protective mode. So when chemotherapy and radiation come along, Um, those healthy cells are already in protective mode, so they die at a lower rate. So they don't die as much in the face of chemotherapy and radiation. But conversely, the tumor cells, when you fast them, they actually end up dying at a higher rate when, when, when the animals undergo chemotherapy and radiation. So you get this positive double edged sword where fasting actually makes chemotherapy and radiation more effective, which is phenomenal. The interesting thing is if you fast the animals after they do chemotherapy and radiation, you don't see the same benefits. So it's really about that timing of starting fasting before chemotherapy and radiation that you see these benefits. Um, Now, the issue is when Walter tried to get a bunch of uh, cancer patients to fast for two to three days prior to chemotherapy and radiation, only a quarter of patients were really willing to do it. The flip side, the positive side is they did see fewer side effects from chemotherapy and radiation. So I think there's less fatigue, less hair loss, less nausea and vomiting. Um, So that's that's a really good thing. Um, So Walter, realizing that most people weren't willing to do these prolonged water only fasts, developed this fasting mimicking diet that you were referring to. And typically for a fasting mimicking diet, you're typically eating about 700 to 1100 calories for three to five days right prior, if you're doing it in conjunction with cancer, right prior to chemotherapy um, and or radiation, and then repeat the cycle, you know, um, no more than once a month, uh, depending on what your, your baseline health is. And he has found that once you get to about three to five days of this fasting mimicking diet, where you're eating this very low protein, low calorie diet, we see a big increase in stem cells and also in ketones, which a lot of people have heard about. And that that's really where a lot of the magic happens per se. And you also get a big decrease in a hormone called uh, IGF-1, insulin like growth factor one. Um, And we know that when this hormone is low, it has anti-cancer effects in the body. And so um, we are just starting to see research studies seeing whether fasting, the fasting mimicking diet and time restricted eating can improve um, the chances of beating cancer. In fact, my lab has one of these trials uh, right now where we're testing time restricted eating to see if it can lower some of the nasty side effects of chemotherapy and radiation at the same time increase your chances of beating cancer. Oh, wow. When will that study be completed? Oh, probably four years from now. We just started. (laughs) So so you mentioned Walter's hypothesis on lower protein, and protein is definitely a hot topic these days. You have people like Walter who make the claim of a lower protein diet being better for longevity. On the other hand, you've got Dr. Peter Atia, who is a huge proponent of protein and takes issue with some of the data out there and, and, and points to this idea of you need protein to build muscle mass, you need muscle mass as you age. Do you have a point of view in, in all of this or are you on the sidelines? I mean, I don't, I don't publish on it, but uh, you know, so some of, I find some of Walter's data is very interesting. It's worth mentioning. So Walter has found a low protein diet is protective under the age of 65, but not over the age of 65. So that's super interesting. And he finds, I forget the exact numbers, but he finds that a lower protein diet reduces the risk of heart disease, diabetes, cancers, et cetera, below the age of 65. And he's done some really phenomenal work, too, looking at people who um, are low in IGF-1, and they, like, develop almost none of our modern Western diseases, per se. Uh, So I tend to fall on that end of the spectrum. But that said, I still would recommend um, uh, not going below the minimum requirements for protein so that you can maintain your muscle mass. And I would recommend eating more protein. Um, as you get older. So it, it's interesting because there's still a lot of debate in the sphere in the research uh, field. So Wayne Campbell has done a lot of really phenomenal work on protein. And what's interesting is a lot of these lower protein diets, you're still able to maintain your muscle mass per se, 
but it looks like right now the recommendation of 0.8 kilograms to one kilo, uh, sorry, 0.8 grams to one gram per kilogram is probably the right sort of range to be in per kilogram of body weight, I should say. Um, so I would probably end on the veer on the lower end of the spectrum, more plant-based protein, because there's some data that plant-based protein is more effective um, in lowering chronic disease risk, but I wouldn't go too low. Um, and there are some negative effects from going too low on bone mass in particular. So individuals who eat really low protein, it does seem to negatively affect their, the amount of bone they have. Right. And in terms of longer fasts, the 24 hours, the, the 48 hours, the two days, three days, you know, uh, if we establish that someone's healthy and they're doing this under proper medical supervision, are there benefits of the longer fast? A longer fast, yeah, we don't know if the longer fast done less frequently, doing a longer fast but less frequently is better than doing these shorter fasts more frequently. So I don't, I don't think we know yet. But we do know that when you do these longer effects, you do get greater stem cell production, more ketones produced, et cetera. Um, I do worry a little bit about retaining muscle mass with some of these longer fasts some interesting work. I think it was out of the University of Bath in the UK where they found that one of these alternate day fasting approaches where every other day you eat nothing, that seemed to be worse for um, maintaining your muscle mass. But that, then again, that that's just seems again. worse for maintaining a life. Yeah, like, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I say that, but yet there's still some people who do this. So, you know, I think the longest I've ever done, I mean, I've done like 27, 28 hours. I think it's been over a year since I did it. And I would do it once every four or five months. Um, but then I said, why? Why am I doing this? Yeah, that's why I like the time restricted eating better than some of these prolonged fasting approaches, a three to five day fast, because you can do it all the time. There are, as far as we know, there are no more serious risks. Right? So some people, if they do a three to five day fast, some people have to be careful about not drinking too much water and diluting the electrolytes in their bloodstream because you can get into, some people can get into two problems pretty quickly if they drink too much water during the fast. In terms of all the science, every, everything we, we talked about, in, in some ways, you know, you've been doing this for a decade, but it's also, we're also really, really, early in this? Where, where, where do you want the science to go from here? What, what are you working on? And what would you like to, to, to see? Yeah. So I think one of, the, uh, one of the most important things is for us to figure out what are the benefits you can get from doing time-restricted eating and skipping breakfast, because I think far more people are willing to do that than to do the early time-restricted eating. So we got to get a little bit clearer more definitive research on like what are the exact benefits that you can get from skipping breakfast is this still is it still better to do time restricted eating by skipping breakfast than to eat three meals across the day so i think really important for us to figure that out tell people i would i also am really interested in the lifespan question so some of um the last i guess the last three four years there have been three really really cool time restricted eating and lifespan studies. One of these studies found that at least 40% of the life extending benefits of calorie restriction are actually not due to eating less, but it's due to having a longer daily fasting period. In other words, for a long time, we thought caloric restriction had all these magic benefits for extending your lifespan. Turns out at least 40% of those benefits were due to time restricted eating. <laughs> because when you have animals do calorie restriction, they naturally eat in a shorter time period. So it turns out, you know, so now we got to kind of go back and figure out how much of the benefits of calorie restriction are due to that longer fasting period versus eating less. And if a lot of those benefits were due to a longer daily fasting period, we should study time restricted eating for extending lifespan. And in fact, there have been a couple other studies in, I think, rodents and fruit flies showing that um, when they did time restricted eating, they live longer. Um, but they had to do time restricted eating at the right sort of circadian time. So that kind of early in the day rather than at nighttime. Um, and I'm actually part of a um, clinical trial right now. We're running a large clinical trial to see, to collect some preliminary data to see if time restricted eating does slow the aging process. So we'll be measuring things like telomere length, 
um, stem cell production, the age of people's DNA, and trying to see if we can kind of slow the aging process with time-restricted eating. And then I think we kind of have to get a little clearer research-wise on how big those weight loss benefits are from time-restricted eating because a lot of the data is all over the map. About half of studies report that there is a benefit for losing weight. Half of studies report there isn't. So I think we are now on the, on the, on the uh, part of the research spectrum where it looks like there's definitely a benefit. So generally when, we, when half of the results are positive, half are negative, there's generally a benefit, usually a little bit smaller than what people expect. So now we're at the stage where we need to do a much larger trial. And then I think we'll be able to translate that into a public health guideline that says, yes, time restricted eating is beneficial for health. So that what I think is the next stage in the next maybe one to three years is we write that grant, do a study with thousands of people and then change dietary diet. That would be amazing. Courtney, thank you so much. You're welcome.